Now about 6 months ago this project started off just as a playground I was learning OpenGL and graphics programming in general and I used to implement whatever I learned into this very project It was not my first OpenGL project I did make a voxel engine on my own before this and it's on GitHub right now you can check it out we'll do a video on that as well someday But the thing is, when I finished implementing skeletal animations in this playground sort of thingy, I thought to myself, why not make a game engine out of it? So months passed by. I did countless rewrites of this thing, system after system, as I kept experimenting and reworking stuff. And it's been all about not just adding game engine oriented features, but also properly redoing the parts that actually make sense from a developer's perspective. and not just for the sake of existence so yeah in this video i'll show you all the major systems and features of obsidian engine and later go into deeper technical details in separate videos where also i'll be doing some dev logs and all so let's get right into it let's start with the core the entity component system or the ecs so what even is an ecs and why do we even need it so think of it like this you have an entity class and it just has a 32 bit unique identifier and a name nothing else but only if could have some properties it would be actually helpful in the game yeah so this is where components come into place they are basically features that you can give to your entities that will make your entities act a certain way so here if i give this empty entity a transform component now it can move around in 3d space yeah now If I take this same entity and give it a mesh renderer and assign it a 3D mesh, boom! Now you got a visible model in your screen. So yeah, that's the crux of ECS. Now that we have covered that, let's move to something more exciting: physics. My engine uses Nvidia's Physics, which is an extremely powerful physics library, the same one used by Unreal, Unity and tons of AAA games like The Witcher 3. I can give this entity a rigid body component which turns this into a cuboidal collider by default. I can even turn it into a sphere and a convex mesh while also being able to offset it from the entity's origin without actually touching the transform component. So there are three types of factors here. Static entities do not move when collided with because their position gets baked in once you hit play. Dynamic entities are fully free in the scene to respond and react to physical forces. And kinematic ones are special because unlike static entities which do not move once the scene starts, kinematic ones can be moved manually in the scene or even by scripts by you and their physics mesh updates live to interact with other objects. Yo! All right, now onto the graphics pipeline. Earlier I had a simple forward rendering PBR pipeline, but I wanted more advanced effects later like SSR and SSGI. So I switched to a deferred rendering pipeline quite early on. Now in deferred rendering, your scene is rendered into multiple passes. All your data like albedo, normals, metallic roughness go into a single buffer named geometry buffer. And later you can do a lighting pass where all of them are used together to calculate the lighting this setup allows you to do screen space effects easily because what they allow you to do is not use the geometry directly but rather use the depth and the normal information in your scene to reconstruct the view space and do your ray marching stuff there so on to the first effect that uses this is global animation Now there are plenty of ways to implement screen space global illumination out of many I chose this one called horizon based global illumination using visibility bit masks it is based on this research paper right here and I also took help of this brilliant article by cyber reality to get it going It took me a while to implement this properly but when it finally worked it was just gorgeous to look at you can literally see the difference here the indirect lighting feels so much more grounded and realistic if you want to know how this paper works in detail you can either read this research paper or read this article by cyber reality i referred to earlier 
Now up next it's screen space reflections. Now my implementation is not super optimized right now but it works. What it does is material aware remarching and screen space using the gbuffer passes as I told you and then renders the result into a dedicated texture which I compose later into the final scene. Yo! Now you can import models with animations or import animations separately and then preview them directly in the scene. All you have to do is select your entity, add a skin mesh renderer which would replace the default mesh renderer component and then from there you can select your preferred animation and just hit play. Here you go. Now the thing is this system also got a massive rewrite. I have features like bone level animation blending and all going on but I have not implemented that properly for editor level here so we'll do it in a dedicated video so let's move on. Now the part that actually lets you make games scripting. So my engine supports Lua as the scripting language and if you don't know Lua is a super fast lightweight and high level language. I used SOL2 to embed it into my engine and expose all the internal C++ APIs and the necessary boilerplate for developers into Lua. So effectively Lua sits right on top of the C++ systems. You get the easy write, high level logic and while all the heavy lifting is still happening under the hood in C++. You can even open VS code directly through the Obsidian editor and edit scripts on the spot. And the best part? Hot reloading. You can just click the reload script button and it updates the specific script instantly. Even when the game's running, you don't even need to pause the running scene. Now one important thing, my engine runtime and the editor are separate classes but in the same project. The editor basically mounts onto the runtime so you can do all your editing in real time and I can just flip one macro to switch it to build mode and all the editor related stuff disappears and you get the pure runtime. But of course this is uh, temporary, eventually I plan to make editor a stand unknown executable and then the engine runtime will be a dynamically linked library. So as I said I would be revealing more in depth stuff later in later devlogs. So this much for this video and I hope you liked it. Thanks for watching.